Uh, we are now moving to the session number three uh, with a, a very challenging title, Transferring the Advice into Momentum. So probably the audience is now expecting something uh, really, really important. We have a change in the program. Uh, Dr. Robert Jan Smith has already been giving his lecture before the lunch, so we have three speakers. Uh, and we have a little bit more time, both for the speakers and also for the panel discussion. And I'm very delighted to invite the first speaker, Professor Mario Lauristin. Uh, all Estonians know her very well because she was a key figure in, in late 80s and early 90s in gaining the second Estonian independence, being also the member of the parliament and the minister, and then also the member of the European Parliament, but most importantly, she is an outstanding uh, social scientist. So, please, Mario. Distinguished guests and hosts, all members of academic community, and some members of political community also sitting here. <laughs> Uh, though, uh, really, my task is, is very difficult because it's so big. Uh, and uh, in order to narrow it, uh, I, I try to base my speech uh, mostly on things I have experienced myself in a double role, because uh, uh, I suppose most maybe interesting was this last period of my life when I was in European Parliament recently. And there I, I, I were in the same time in double role because I was a member of the team which was dealing with European digital development. Uh, I was a rapporteur on, on uh, data protection and privacy. Uh, at the same time being all my life uh, a communication researcher. And uh, in this capacity also making a lot of data processing. I, I was also with other hat of the researcher and expert in the field. So it was for me really a very interesting experience of this controversy between those two different perspectives. Uh, but uh, before I, I come to that, uh, maybe I start from a bit more broader view. Uh, the topic of this conference really is uh, is uh, is very, very important, very ambitious, uh, and it presumes that we really are in some special kind of society, which is now called in this title information rich. Um, social scientists really prefer to speak about information saturated society, because uh, um, if it's rich or poor, it's a different question. Fact is that it is saturated with all kind of data information and information processing activities. And uh, then in, in this situation, the uh, question about the role of academy, uh, here in this title, it's narrowed a bit to the advisor role. Uh, but uh, we know very well that in this kind of society, the academy also has not only advisor role, it also has uh, some productive role. Because the knowledge production is very important, in the most important part of the society. Though in this title there is a contradiction. It's a contradiction of two really perceptions. A perception from the past where academy was something like this nice kind environment for nice people having a lot of time to discuss things, to contemplate, then to go back to own laboratories, so on, to think it all over and so on. And from other side, this information saturated or information rich society, which one of main characteristics really is uh, social acceleration, acceleration of decision making, acceleration of whole processes of mutual uh, uh, influences, interactions. And now one of very, very difficult issues really is, is coming out from this contradiction in, in the timing, the acceleration of the decision-making 
and the slowing down nature of the academic life, academic thinking, academic decision making, not in political term, but in making difference between truth and, and not truth, uh, the, the uh, evidence and uh, non-evidence and so on. Though, uh, the whole issue really we're discussing here is about founding, uh, finding this kind of interface, of finding this mechanism, uh, which can really make possible this mutual impact in a positive way. Uh, first thing what I really want to state is that maybe uh, it's good that we have this kind of mechanism of slowing down uh, this acceleration of the decision making. Uh, in this sense, academy is not very much different from parliament. Parliament is also the mechanism which is in history created for slowing down uh, process of decisions because if all decisions would be taken by generals uh, in this speed of military action, then um, maybe humankind had survived at all, all already killed in some or other wars. And uh, though when I think about productive relationship between academy and, and, and po political community or political decision making, then the first mechanism or first place I'm thinking about really is a parliament. Uh, because uh, here we can find already uh, uh, available institutional frame uh, for meaningful discussion between people of knowledge and people in power or close to power. And uh, here in Estonia, uh, just nowadays, just today, yesterday, uh, we have started a new discussion about the role of parliament, namely in this capacity to make decisions more wise, more evidence-based, to have a proper way to communicate, to discuss the state of affairs. Uh, already it was mentioned that today parliament was discussing a uh, very important issue for Estonia, that the future of the oil shale-based uh, energy production. And uh, certainly it's a very, very complicated issue. Uh, complicated not so much uh, maybe any more in sense of science, in narrow sense, in, in the production, but namely very complicated for society itself because it will bring in issues which are not available for, for, for research, even for those people who are concentrated on, on the technological side of the process. Because the most difficult situation here is connected with economic and not only economic, mostly social thing about the people there, what was happened with these people. And here we come then to political area. Because here politicians really have to decide about people. Politicians are not deciding about technology, they are deciding about people. And, and then when we want here also to have academic advice, scientific input, then it's different kind of, of knowledge, different kind of academic areas. It's social science. It's social science in terms of economic science, but even more in terms of sociology, anthropology even, psychology, uh, educational science. Uh, and uh, what I feel very strongly, not only because I am from social science myself, uh, but namely because of this experience of decision making in this very complicated situation about things which are on the surface technological, like this digital, say, area, and in the essence, in impact very deeply social, economic, psychological, anthropological, even philosophical. That we now really are approaching this situation where this old division between sciences 
as such hard, respected, powerful, well-financed. And those, oh no, the social sciences now are the science or the art or just the blah, blah, blah. And all oh, they can do with small money and then maybe they can do without money at all. I suppose that that's a situation very well known for, for many, many, many people. And for very old time, even like traditional, legitimate, Yes, philosophy. It's ph philosophy is not producing anything, you know. They are just talking. But when we come to the same digital thing, then we are really approaching this moment where there is really time to think about purely, purely classically philosophical things. What is a human being? What does it mean to be a human being? And how this technological development suddenly can produce quite maybe even dramatical disruption in the whole development of humankind. And it's not just general issue. In the same work in European Parliament, uh, we were in the situation where people who really don't have a clue nor about the all technological issues and not so much also about philosophy had to vote to vote on decisions which will forbid or enhance some developments regulate areas which really would demand a lot of thinking in absolutely new terms of philosophical, technological, scientific, uh, social problems altogether. And I suppose that that's a uh, situation nowadays in, in, in many areas where really decisions are made, voted, implemented, really with a hope that maybe, maybe nothing really bad happened. And here maybe the most important role of scientific advice would be Advice to wait a bit, to withdraw, not to rush with this legislation, not to rush with this kind of steps until there is no really solid analysis, even not maybe always evidence, but analysis about the whole complexity of the issue, about the whole different layers, aspects, the complicated chains of events which could start from this decision. And I'm very glad that in, in this report where I was uh, involved, uh, we uh, deleted articles uh, which were meant to regulate already machine-to-machine -machine communication and implementation of artificial intelligence. And it was a decision made namely because we decided that there is not yet enough knowledge to make any kind of regulatory decision here, that we have to wait and to go on with research, with practices, be careful, be uh, watchful, and then come back. But. Uh, very often in this situation, we run into uh, not lack of knowledge in terms of uh, concrete research done, but in much more fundamental level, lack of education or, or maybe education which is not really well tuned or well matching the problems and issues which are uh, important now. And 
again, with the uh, help of this experience uh, working in this uh, digital area. Uh, for example, uh, we came to understanding that there is a need to protect people from uh, this new situation where, like you all and we all know well, they are really in information-rich society or data-rich society producing themselves, really, the uncontrollable bulk of data with all practices every day what they are involved in. And then when we started to discuss here, uh, we had a report, report. We had a report on big data. And then we had a report on robotics, you know. All these topics already are on the table of legislators. And then we, we run all time into question that when we say, for example, that all people, just all people should know what are the algorithms of profiling concerning their data. And then we asked, my God, how all people have to know that if in the content of education, if you look at the curricula in general education in schools, there is not even maybe no place where they can acquire this knowledge which will allow them to implement this right given by legislation. Or when we now go to the other area, uh, maybe away from this kind of technological developments where these issues are, ri are raising or rising uh, day after day. Look at the enormous crisis Europe, the whole world is living in. The crisis which we call uh, migration crisis, population crisis, everything, democratic, democracy crisis. And it, it, it's all coming like something which is unexpected, something like natural catastrophe. But when we now again ask if these events could have had some, say, foresight, some uh, warning given by academies, scientists, researchers, or why it wasn't the case, why legislation, for example, in EU was absolutely not prepared to this kind of situation, why the institutions were not prepared to make decisions, why politicians were not prepared to intervene. We come again back to, at first, the issue, what kind of science would have been needed in this situation? And again, more broadly, what kind of education these people who are making decisions would have needed in order to be capable to use research data or research advice? And here is a situation much more worse compared to technological knowledge or compared to this technological area. Because the area, for example, digital development, it's a happy area, it's a positive area. Everybody is for, everybody is expecting something good. Everybody is expecting that society will be richer and people will have more, uh, more time and everything, more access to everything, so on. The all kind of critical warnings they are still very much on periphery. Crisis is not yet here. Humankind yet is not having full understanding what could happen. But with migrat migration crisis, it all was there. And in this situation, what was uh, for me as a social scientist, the most tragic was that really in social science community, there have been a lot of thinking, a lot of researching concerning all kinds of reactions of people on this kind of situation, on cultural conflicts, uh, on premises of democracy in different cultures, all these kind of things. That's one side of the problem. And the other side of the problem is that 
if you look at the EU, if you look at the understanding of the cultural sciences, uh, problems connected with nationality, problems connected with religions, that they are all like out of, uh, say, circle of uh, respected topics. And even in this situation where we had, uh, we meaning uh, EU, on the shores of Greece and Italy, hundreds of thousands of people coming from different culture, different religion, with, with in, in, in a crisis, in, in the situation of human catastrophe, even in this crisis, it, 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 it was like absolutely non-understandable what to do in order to understand those people and how to make them uh, understandable and acceptable to people uh, in Europe. What, what, what we can do with that? Education, too late. Legislation, too slow. Institutions, too costly. And then, what we saw that Greece and Italy were really asking for help. Help was proposed in the most unsuitable way. And we got not only the human catastrophe, we got political crisis up to Brexit. And I dare to say that the application of cultural and social and scientific knowledge to all these problems, not in this moment, but earlier, as part of uh, education for politicians, as part of understanding and anal an analytical tools to legislative process, were not used because, because they are concerning very inconvenient issues, very conflictual issues, not comfortable. And uh, here, I suppose it's one of differences between this academic and political interest or academic and political approach. Because political approach is always connected with kind of uh, fears and fears which are not existential. It's fears connected with power or losing power or losing support losing rating, losing votes, all this kind of like adapting to environment where decisions are made. Whereas scientific or academic approach, academic knowledge in principle should be independent, autonomous, oriented only toward the say hard, uh, hard facts or very strict analytical uh, tools, sy systemic view, not disturbed, not shifted toward any outer practical interest. But is that the case? Unfortunately not. We all know that there are topics which are profitable also in academic life and there are profits which are not. And for that, those social scientific topics, what I mentioned about culture, religion, all the things, they are not only politically uncomfortable, but they are also academically not profitable. And here, I suppose it's one of very, very, say, dangerous things, where we try to adapt our advice, adapt our research programs, to this, uh, say, practical interest of political institutions or also economic institutions. Not in terms of implementing our knowledge for something new, I'm not talking about that, but other way, restricting ourselves not to speaking out, not to make research, not to be capable to make research because of lack of resources, when knowing at the same time that these are questions which should be researched thoroughly, which should be analyzed, which should be very honestly and deeply 
brought into the public eye. And here we come to public interest and public opinion. Because the only way to, to safeguard academic, uh, this kind of autonomy and respectfulness is to have the very strong conviction in society that what academics are doing, what academy, what science is doing, it is in public interest. It is higher of those, say, everyday, all kind of considerations. The respect for science in society is a guarantee that we can be in our academic life really uh, corresponding to this mission and role expected. And here we see, for example, in Estonia, where we now in, uh, is in, uh, again, current discussion about the financing of scientific uh, research, that there is a lot of difficulties to reach this goal, which was even set in some official documents, to have the 1% of GDP for research. When we discussed it, it was just a week, a bit more than a week ago, the special conference, why it's so, why we cannot go over this zero point something, why we cannot reach even 1%. Then, uh, really, the issue was raised about the public understanding of the role of science, public understanding of why we need this kind of fixed role, fixed finance, fixed, say, place for academy and society. And it is not so easy to explain. Because there are very nice examples of this and that new thing which was based on this and that research. But it's not speaking about science as a whole. It's not speaking about this kind of activity, kind of role as such role of knowledge, role of independent knowledge, if you want the role of truth. And here, I suppose it's very sad to acknowledge that there have been made very big harm uh, for all this area by this logic of purely, say, market-based thinking. Because we all know that until you can make money from something you're thinking about, what you're researching, it will take not only time, it could take some other things also, not only time. Maybe availability of people, maybe uh, readiness of institutions, maybe good position, economic situation in whole world market or whatever, whatever. There are contingencies you cannot even predict but the same idea that academic work, role of academy in society in itself is a guarantee that in the decisive issues, decisive moments, in so-called big picture, society has the tool and has the source to avoid fatal, fatal decisions, fatal mistakes. That already is a very big value. And I think really that uh, in current time, maybe in name this time of the social acceleration, this warning, warning mission, warning role of independent academic knowledge could not be undervalued in opposite in opposite. Happily, also in everyday practice, in everyday political practice, we are more and more uh, using so-called risk analysis and using researchers, scientific advisors, not only for discovering something good and nice and new, but also for giving warnings about the risks, about the, the, the unsolved issues, and then 
preparing or proposing the solutions. The problem is with social sciences here that social sciences are very often involved in issues what could be named so-called wicked problems. They don't have one good solution. Very often they have bad and worse solutions or say mediocre solutions but not very good ones. And here I suppose it's also important that with the help of academic approach, looking at the whole field, whole complexities of society in the certain time, in a certain moment of history and so on, we can have more clear understanding also about this comparative seriousness of different risks. Because what about politicians? Politicians really, yeah, yeah they would like, and me too, when I, I, I am also in the role of politician sometimes even now, uh, we, we, we will, in some situation would prefer to close eyes on risk, saying that, oh, we make this decision now, elections will be tomorrow, but risks will emerge and show themselves, maybe after 10 years, and whatever. We, we will not be there anymore. We have had our benefits already. And again, here is this academic view with this long-term thinking and, and the deep thinking, which for society means capacity to look further, see the more fundamental processes, more important things to achieve and more tragical maybe uh, risks to be understood and, if possible, avoided, if possible, softened. Though, uh, what I can say is that in this situation, it is very important that even in such a small community like we have here in Estonia, with not so many people doing research, and also with not so many people making politics, uh, we would try to see this complexity, this whole picture, and share it with people around us in society. Because when we talk about public interest as legitimation for science and public interest as legitimation for politics, then really this public interest is rooted in the common understanding of very, very different people. And that means, again, that education is key and core, but for public understanding, unfortunately, not only education, but also everyday communication, media, all what we tell, all what we can explain to people. And here I understand that Ulle Matisse will, will be, in her talk, more concentrating on this communication issues. Uh, what I have to say is that also this is part of education. This is also part of education, how we communicate things. And uh, last but not least, what is the practical advice? How to make politicians wiser, parliament more effective, scientists more, say, respected and heard in different institutions and so on. Here, one thing is important. There should be educated, knowledgeable people who can understand different areas of research in a way that it is connected with the practical issues which are raised in political field, in the ministries, and so on. These people are not coming uh, by political recruitment. They are not coming from outside. It's also part of our uh, research and educational efforts. And when we lo look at our Estonian society, then there is a very, very big problem that among decision makers, also among political, not only, but also economic decision makers, also entrepreneurial community, 
The demand for academic education, including the demand for people with doctoral degrees who really are capable to understand this link between the, 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 the academic thinking and research and the practical needs, practical interests, who are capable to interpret things from one side to another. Really, demand for these people is, until now, very, very low. Very, very low. We know that our doctoral students, uh, very often, they cannot find the work outside the academy. Like, the only career is to be taught and then teach again. And in this sense, for example, in the European Parliament, what I there discovered, for me, it was really a new situation where it was normal that you have academic advisors, meaning educated, trained, knowledgeable about research, working in everyday parliamentary surroundings and organizing the conferences, roundtables, uh, uh, expert papers, all that, knowing where and what and with who connect politicians, because politicians themselves, they, they, they are not prepared and they really shouldn't be uh, to be prepared to, to find out themselves everything. Though there are the ideas to have some kind of centers, and here was presented, that's very good if ministries will create centers. But looking at this very speedy work, speedy de decision-making processes, it's very important that there will be real individuals, people, knowledgeable and having real good imagination, academic imagination around decision makers in parliament, in ministries, this kind of people, but also in big corporations, what we don't have also. So now we are working on the strategic uh, say plan for how to develop Estonian education for the next period and I suppose it's one of very important uh, challenges there to, to, to raise uh, awareness of society about need to have academics among politicians academics among industrials not then as academics but as interpreters between these two or three different spheres. And I hope that uh, it is advice we can make and it will be accepted. So, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you very much. Yeah, I can see you. Well, we'll pick it up. So, thank you very much for this um, uh, very thoughtful presentation. Uh, the presentation is open for discussion. Questions, please. Local Estonianist <coughs> Research Council. You told that there should be more educated people in the decision, closer to the decision making bodies. What's the mechanism? How to get them there? At first, to increase, to increase the number of doctorate students. At first, because as, for example, if we will have one or two places per year, then just they all really are absorbed by academy itself. Then to change the nature of doctorate studies on some areas, we have some ideas about this uh, applied doctorships. Uh, but also, I suppose, the other thing is to, to how to say, to increase the, the interest of how academic community in those practical issues. And this interest is not something which is purely like psychological, it's a practical thing. And here we come to this so, so, so many, many million times discussed problem about the criteria of evaluation of academic work, academic career, about this uh, situation where everything which is, for example, in Estonia, uh, important for Estonian society, normally should be understood by Estonian politicians and the Estonian public, meaning it should be in Estonian language. 
and everything which is good for academician to make a career should be not in Estonian language, but in English. And that's a, like a simple, but very strong barrier, because our academicians, young academicians, our doctorates and so on, they are not trained to explain in plain Estonian what they are really doing and why they are doing and what is interesting in what they are doing. And people who are in this political or industrial community, they don't have any practice to discuss with people from academy what they are doing. And I can tell you, I am teaching uh, uh, in our economics faculty and also in Tallinn Business School for master students. They are master students coming from industries. They are entrepreneurs, uh, sometimes high officials, uh, and so on. They have never heard about, for example, contemporary theories about how society is functioning. They are discovering absolutely unknown, interesting, exciting realities. Because I can produce them this picture in plain Estonian, based on my knowledge of what is going on and what have been researched in social science, and they suddenly discover that it is really valid for their everyday activities. Wow! That means that we need this kind of communication, we need this kind of attention and interest between these different communities. But it cannot be achieved if we don't motivate our academic students and professors uh, to do something in Estonia for Estonia, in Bulgaria for Bulgaria, in Italy for Italy. I don't know, maybe it's everywhere in different ways, only in Estonia we have this crazy situation. Thank you. If there are no more questions, thank you very much. <clears throat>